So, uh, kind of as a follow-up of this morning discussion, I'm going to focus this talk a little bit more on industrial expression host and fermentation. Uh, first things first, so just a reminder on this slide. So what are we talking about here? Again, it's commodity enzyme. So not pharmaceutical, but commodity, so cheap enzyme. So same thing as this morning. Uh, well, that one uh, put low market, but it's high commodity, secreted, hasn't changed. Cost of production is major. So what does that involve at the fermentation level? You cannot have any expensive co-feeding. So a lot of people talk about Pichia pastoris. Pichia pastoris as a biotin oxotrophy. So you need to put biotin in the media. This is extremely expensive, and when you're looking at cheap uh, fermentation process, you cannot do that. Also, when you want to induce expression, you cannot use IPTG, right? If you're talking about a 50,000 liter fermenter, putting IPTG would just be economically non-viable. It has to be a simple fermentation process, meaning cheap media and not too many change in the phase of the fermentation. You want simple. Uh, most of the people at the plant are not scientists, they are operators and they follow sequences, process sequences. So it needs to be fairly simple to some extent. And you also need to have a good host, robust, which is not prone too much to contamination and can also take a lot of pressure. Because when you're at the bottom of 50,000 uh, liter of water, you better be sure you're not going to be crushed. So there are cases where actually the pressure destroyed the microorganism and the production did not work. They did not test that at the pilot plant. So often on pilot fermenter, you have ways to put some pressure in the headspace to mimic these kind of things. So host requirements. So I'll start with the host and then move on slowly to the fermentation. So bear with me. So what do you need for industrial enzyme production? So again, this is kind of a summary of what I learned at Novozymes and this company and ECI and what is happening right there. So first, your host, you need genetic tools, right? You need to be able to introduce DNA, foreign DNA. We are talking about recombinant uh, producer, platform host. If you cannot transform, if you cannot integrate DNA stably in the genome, it's not going to work. You also need to know the promoters. You need to have a high secretory potential to facilitate the downstream processes. So that's why, in that case, filamentous fungi secrete a lot of enzymes because they are saprophyte and need to degrade the mat uh, organic matter in the soil. So these are good starting points. You want also things which can grow fast. If it takes two weeks to generate biomass, you are not going to be able to achieve the productivity which is going to lead to the right um, spec and lower your cost. So you need something, with, and you need an aerobic metabolism. Because if you start being anaerobic, you'll start fermenting the biochemical terms of the fermentation, and you're going to create secondary overflow metabolites. And they often are inhibitory to the growth, but also for the downstream processes, they can be toxic to some of the, um, uh, they can counteract the effect of some of the, the, the compounds you add later on in the formulation of the enzyme. <coughs> Process temperature. 30 degrees Celsius is the preferred for cost. Uh, actually, not for cost, for contamination. For cost, it would be the other way around because you actually need to cool. Sometimes metabolism generates heat and you need to cool off. But for the contamination, 37 degrees for some reason is really prone to contamination. 30, not things don't grow that much at 30. Or human introduced type of contaminants. You want <coughs> minimum media for growth to decrease the cost of production. So again, no expensive cofactors. So you're looking at hosts which have the novel synthesis of most of the cofactor, but also vitamins. It has to be safe to human, animal, and the environment. If you, again, start killing people at the plant, that's not good. <laughs> if all the animal or insect die as soon as they get nearby to the plant, no good. 
And for the environment, same thing. If you suddenly become a no man's land around your factory, that's not a good sign. And it's obviously, in our case, we are talking about product, product for consumer. So you don't want to produce any clinical antibiotics to prevent the, toler the resistance against antibiotics. So if you're using filamentous fungi, you're going to have to go and knock out all the pathways for the production of secondary metabolites, which are most likely antimicrobial and can be considered in some extent as antibiotic. And then again, intellectual properties. Always, always, and always. You want to limit the licensing fees because you can use something from a different, uh, you can license a host. So I worked in a company where we licensed Piquilla Pastoris. And at the end, the sales were almost offsetting the price of the license. So and there was not much profit made out of it. And you also want to avoid the royalties. Sometimes you can have a few percent of the profits going there. But if you start with that, and then you add some genetic engineering tools and licensing, at the end of the day, your <coughs> profit share decreases. So in the lab, regardless of the industry or not, you start from your sequence, you clone it in a model organism, organism host, and you get a few milligrams of protein. That's enough to do what you want to <coughs> do in terms of biochemical characterization and improvements. On, uh, of the enzyme per se, so, but when you get to the industrial production, often you switch to a different organism. So what are the common hosts? So you'll find that in the case of protease, you'll find in the detergent, most likely it's produced using bacillus subtilis. So different companies may have different strains of bacillus subtilis, but most of them will be producing the proteases from bacillus subtilis. A second one is Aspergillus oryzae, and you have obviously Aspergillus niger. These two filamentous fungi are fairly common. In the case of Novozymes, they developed a special one, which was Fusarium venenata. So this one produces toxins, so they have to be knocked out. And finally, Trichoderma is a fairly uh, ubiqui uh, commonly used host for the, um, all the cellulase type of enzyme production. These are like the five major. Every big company may have developed different organisms. So I know, for example, Cargill, so a big company in the US which produced some chemicals and also some type of enzyme for themselves developed from scratch a special host, it was a yeast. And they developed all the tools, the genetic tools and everything, and they used that for production of compounds, also in some cases for biofuel and some for protein production in some cases. But it's not uncommon that companies are gonna develop their own host. For that, the best resources is to go and look on Google patterns and type a name of a company and some kind of bacillus, aspergillus, and see what comes out. And you'll find that that's most case, in most cases, they've been developing internally some host. So why do we need a range of hosts? Why don't you just stick to one, use it as a platform, and can use that all the time? Well, some are al alkalophilic and some are acidophilic. So this can have an impact on, the produ on uh, your production. Some enzyme might be more stable in alkaline solution, and some can be more in acidophilic conditions. So this can make a big difference. They have different side activities, meaning some may have more proteases and different uh, proteases which gonna be uh, which gonna be degrading your protein of interest. Or they may have different ways to be fed. So some might be able to use uh, carbon, uh, five carbon sugar, or they might use six carbon sugar. So based on the availability of the raw material and the cost, you might be able to switch. If you use sucrose versus glucose, some may work better than others on that. Well, 
the competitor IP, like I said, may limit what you can do in specific hosts. Let's say you have an enzyme which is patented in trichoderma. Well, fine, just express it in aspergillus then, and you'll get out of the patent. And finally, you have different secretion potential. This is how to know in advance before trying if one enzyme is going to work better in another host. Well, I'll get back to that in a few seconds. You can make some guess, but you have mainly have to try and see what works. So why not E. coli for commodity compound? It has poor secretion potential. So it's not made to secrete. I mean, you can engineer some to do some secretion, but it doesn't work that well. And in a way, depending on the enzyme, bad folding properly. So Dick was talking about uh, inclusion body. This is not what you want at the industrial scale because refolding would be too expensive and take time. That would be an extra step, and you don't want to go there. Now for anti um, antibodies production and other high value type of protein, you can use it because the cost of production is going to be totally offset by the value of the, of the final product. It's a relatively expensive fermentation, meaning that there are some oxotrophies, so you have to do some feeding with special <coughs> vitamins and things like that, so it's expensive. And it's also, the main reason is actually it's really susceptible to phage contamination. And this is a disaster when it happens at a plant because you never recover from that. It's, it's, it's a phage, so it's virus for bacteria. And as soon as you get contaminated with that, you most likely have spread the phage everywhere. So you have cases where it just dis demolish the whole fermentation unit and rebuild a new one because they were never able to recover the production level they had before the infection. And you also have, since it usually grows in a rich media at 37 degrees, you also have bacteria contamination. Saccharomyces, well, poor secretion potential, you have some vitamin requirement, and it also ferment, meaning that if you have some uh, zone in the fermenter with low oxygen is going to start producing ethanol. And that's not what you want because the ethanol can have an impact on the downstream process. Moreover, if your fermenter or your facility is not equipped to produce highly flammable products like ethanol, you could end up having catastrophic collateral damages. If you have ethanol vapor that sparks, it's going to explode. So which host for which enzyme? So you can have some guess based on the origin of the gene you want to express. Let's say you want a prokaryote. Well, you most likely can go ahead and use a prokaryote. If it's from bacillus, use bacillus. But it doesn't always work this way. Sometimes you really have to do some trial and error. You can see also based on the enzyme processing requirement. For example, you can have uh, proenzymes which require to be activated with a cleavage, and if it comes from one type of prokaryote, it might not work in another one. So you have to look for that, and make sure that it's, it's, it's compatible. And you have a glycosylation. In our case, it's not so much of an issue. In most of the commodity enzymes, you have no glycosylation or no fancy uh, post-translational modification, but it still happens every once in a while. So you have to, to look into that. And then again, I, uh, patents. So it's really trial and error. And sometimes, depending on the application, you also have uh, the, the type of microorganism if you're working in an enzyme which is going to be in the food industry. For example, if you use Bacillus subtilis, I don't know if you have smelled the fermentation from Bacillus subtilis, but it doesn't smell good. And so you can have issues with the taste. So there are some cases where they tried with bacillus, used the broth, and it was something which was used in, a, in, in, a, in food, and it just did not taste good. So they had to switch microorganisms to get you something which was better. And again, uh, safety is a main issue. So you also need to develop some genetic tools. 
if they are not there. So model organism, it's fairly easy. It's already there, you can order. When you start working with trichoderma, with aspergillus, it's not as clear. You don't have as much resources available. So you have to optimize transformation. So in some cases, you have different type of transformation. You can target directly to the genome, or you can have what they call ectopic uh, insertion, meaning it goes wherever, it's not targeted in the <coughs> genome. And in that case, you want to have as many CFU, so colony forming unit after transformation per milligram of DNA. If you use, usually it's microgram, but let's say you use few milligram of DNA and you get five colonies, that's not a good sign. Because you, 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 you want to have a lot of strains because resulting from the transformation, because you can test more clones. And sometimes you'll find that if you test 100 clones, they're all going to have a basic level of activity, but one's going to be really good. You don't know why, you'll sequence, you did the exact same stuff, but things happen and it can work better. So it's better to screen more than one or two clones resulting from a transformation, but as many as you can. DNA integration. You want stable integration in the genome, because when you're going to be in a fermenter, you're going to push the generation time they're going to be in exponential phase for a long time. So they're going to double depending on the host between an hour to two hours. So you're going to really push in a non-physiological way for a microorganism. You're going to push it to, to double and really grow. And if it's not stable, you're going to lose your genes. And then you're going to end up at the end of your fermentation with a lot of biomass, but not much protein per biomass. So you want something stable for fermentation. And the best way to test that, usually, is to actually take, at the end of a fermentation, you take the same clone and you re-ferment, or you put it back into your tank cycle, and you make sure that it stays the same. You will never do that in the industry, but just to troubleshoot at the lab scale. At the end of the fermentation, you re-inoculate new tank with the same organism and you should have the same spec. If it starts going down, you may not be as stable as you want. DNA integration, like I said, it can be targeted, <coughs> or it can be kind of random. Mm -hmm. Depending on the microorganism, you have to live with it and that's how it is. Transcription expression, so for the genetic engineering, it's really important to have different parts, meaning a panel of strengths of promoter because sometimes strong promoter is going to express a lot of protein but then the cost to produce this protein is going to have a repercussion on the fitness of the microorganism. So you might make a lot of protein with one cell but your cell will have no energy to double. So you have to find the right spot where you can still generate biomass and produce enough enzyme, but you sometimes don't want to produce too much because you're not going to have enough growth. Then you can optimize your ribosome binding site, and obviously you adapt the genes you want to express by using the codon frequency table of your host. Finally, you can have secretion optimization by signal peptides, optimizing them, trying a bunch of different ones. So good genetic tools are essential. So that's a requirement, and sometimes you have to spend years to get there in order to get what you want. People often overlook this step and say, yeah, we'll figure it out. It's close to something which is published, and you'll see that species to species, it's going to be totally different. So consideration for production of industrial enzyme. The time to market must be short. Sometimes you have less than a year from the strain to trying to sell your enzyme and your, to your application. So you want fast, predictable scale-up, meaning if you have a platform <coughs> organism and you already know all the constraints associated to the fermentation, it's easier to reuse that because you have some know-how and some learning already made. <coughs> You're not rediscovering everything. It's a commodity item, so the pricing is going to be low. So again, low-cost fermentation process, minimal recovery steps. And sometimes the purity is not specially for the enzyme, but it's a requirement of the, pers of the, the company who's going to buy your enzyme. If it looks brownish, kind of like gross stuff, 
it might not look good to put that in a product where you're gonna where the consumer is gonna see it and it's supposed to wash for example laundry if your powder is all brown you you're gonna have a psychological psychological effect which tells you that it's not good so you have color and order you don't want things to stick in there and it has to be stable finally you have regulatory issues and you want what we call grass, which means generally recognized as safe. Hopefully it's more than generally, but all the time, because you don't want to use something which produces toxins. You are not gonna use, for example, bacillus anthracis, which produces the anthrax toxin and kills you, even if it has good secretion ability. And even if you knock out the pathway to the toxin, you're never going to get anybody to allow you to use that on the market. So it has to be safe from the beginning. Don't assume you can make something which is not safe or pathogenic safe. So never work, if you're targeting this type of industry, always work with something clean. So you have a lot of upfront effort on the whole strain development. And things you can do, I'll get back a little bit, but you want low protein, protease background, so it's secreted, obviously, so that minimizes the downstream processes. And you want to plug and play fermentation methods, so you know it's gonna work. So like E. coli, regardless what you put in it, it's always variation on the same recipe. So a typical strain improvement path. You start by reducing the protein background of the whole strain. So for example, depending what you want, a lot of these secretory microorganisms produce a lot of amylases and amyloglycosidase. So you want to get rid of that, just for the background. So you start with something clean. You want to reduce the protease activity, so specific protease genes and the protease activator. So these are uh, genetic engineering of your host. And that's where different companies might do different things and have different ways. You want to eliminate the unwanted metabolites. Like I said, you can have like oxalic acid, which is going to be potentially an inhibitor of, of the growth of, of, the, of your microorganism in tanks. Or you can have some acid, which is going to kind of be an issue for the downstream process and make it less efficient. So that means you're going to have less protein from the fermentation. So you want to get rid of that. You need to optimize the expression vector, so improve promoters. Antibiotic resistance marker free strains. Most people who work in the industry do not want to have the product in contact with antibiotic. Never. Even, even when you transform at the lab scale, even when you're on a plate, you need to find different markers. So you can introduce it, um, oxotrophy by knocking out some genes for vitamins and then you supplement with it as a marker gene. You remove one of the enzymes and then you add it on your vector. So that's your marker gene. And you want to increase the, the, the secretion potential. So for that you can go through the what we call system biology, trying to understand how it works through R omics or RNA-seq genomics and this type of methodology, or you use classical mutagenesis. Again, like I was saying this morning, this actually works the best. So, well, obviously you can do that with synthetic biology. It was the same stuff that I showed this morning. Uh, I'm showing that because in my current work, we use the same platform as I described this morning, but this time to make expression host. So different type of application, different type of product, but you still use all this methodology to develop genetic engineering tools. So what you really want to have is platform organisms. So for example, Novozymes was, is still a specialist and world class leader in fermentation of these different hosts. You have different people with different skills for this fermentation host and they know how to use it, <coughs> that's all they do. Some people have been fermenting, for example, Fusarium for more than 20 years. Some have knowledge with Aspergillus, I don't remember if it's Niger or all right, I think it's the Niger, this one. They've been doing it for decades, so there's a lot of know. Bacillus as well, you'll find in the literature some stuff. So you need 
to develop a set of platform strains, you need good genetic tools, know-how on how to use it, the right downstream processing, and a plug-and-play like system, like model organism. So you I'm want to get your model you have your host or from this morning, you have some kind of enzyme. So again, different companies may have different Now you need to ferment. So fermentation has three different use in the industry or in general. First, you can develop, you can use it for the screen, you, meaning you have different, in that case, you have some transformants, you made mutants, you do shake flask, you rank candidates, and then here you pick the best candidate in fermenter. So you have a process which is close to the production process, and you can use it as a screen. As we'll see later, you can also use it as a development tool for production of an enzyme, meaning you don't really know how it works. So you can use it for that, or you can use it as a scale down, which is the opposite of scale up, and I'll get to that. So this is kind of the traditional lab scale fermentation bottleneck, as it was for many years, but now it looks like that, depending where you work. So transformers, in that case, you are a thousand per week. Mutants, you can make as many as you want. And then you have mini reactors now on slides like that. So it's a microscope slide. It works. I'm showing it. It's not yet working as good as it could. But you can ferment up to 30,000 microbes at once on this thing. And it's not a, it's, it's a pre-screen. It's a selection step. But that gives you an idea of which candidate you want to rank and which one you don't want to use. So usually you deselect right there for growth and things like that. And one thing is that you can look at your enzyme production by coding every well with your substrate. And if it's colorful, you can see very easily and using uh, image processing software which ones <coughs> are working and not working. These are still in development. I actually <coughs> was supposed to test one two years ago, but I left the company, so I'm going uh, Finally, here, the fermentation bottleneck in the lab is also changing because now you have this 24 reactor ramp. So you have 24 small reactors which are disposable, and you can run all of them at once independently. So that can greatly improve your throughput for your fermentation, and this is only requiring one person. So if you look at regular glass vessel tanks, you can maybe ferment up to eight. One person can do eight tanks at once. But in that case, you can do easily 24 with one person. So you increase your throughput, and you can also use the flexibility of the system to do optimization. So you can screen, you can optimize. So, to get a little bit more into fermentation consideration, you have two major host classes for expression host. Right? So, bacterial and fungal. The difference here, bacterial, they grow really fast. So, you can do fermentation in two to four days. So, really a lot of cycles, and meaning what really is important in the industry is how many tank, you, of how many fermentation per year you can do. So if you have a two-day process, you can do a lot, right? But if it takes four days, you're going to do half of it. So that can be an issue. But again, it depends on your productivity and the total title of enzyme you reach. You have high oxygen demand due to the fast growth. This can be an issue. You have fast cellular response, meaning that if your feed is not fast enough or something happens, they're going to react right away. So there's no flexibility, you need a tight control, you have to be careful. You have low viscosity, which is good because viscosity in big fermenter is an issue for oxygen transfer. And all the transformants usually are identical because the way things are screened and the way things work, even for a single event, often you get the same when you screen a lot of clones, you'll get similar level of expression of the enzyme. It's not true when you get to fungal. So they are slow grower. They can take up to 200 hours per fermentation. So that's about a week, more than a week. 
you have a lower oxygen demand due to the slower growth, meaning you won't spend as much energy mixing your tank. So you lower the cost, so it kind of offsets the cost here. So you have a slower, slower cellular response, meaning that if you're fit, so what you, when you are filling the fermenter with a feed, it's less stringent. You can have, you can have um, a small decrease in the feed. It's not going to impact your fermentation. It just has more momentum. You have higher viscosity, so mixing is a big issue. So you need dif different type of impeller sometimes, different reactor. Often to get from one to the other at the industry, in the industry you have reactors for fungal and then for bacteria. You cannot always inter-exchange the two because of the different specificity. Not always the case, but even at the lab scale we often have to rearrange our fermenter when we were switching from one culture to the other one. <coughs> and then here because of the way transformation happens, you may you may have different, you may have variation in your transformers, meaning that one gene can be introduced more than once in the genome, even if you just did it once. So here screening can be interesting because you might find what we call the jackpot clone, something which is going to express three or four times <coughs> the enzyme of the other one. So you have to screen a lot of them. So now let's look a little bit more into the fermentation development. So you start traditionally with 1.5 liter fermenter or smaller, like I was saying, the ramp, the 24 bioreactor ramp is about 250 milliliters. But traditionally in the industry, you will still find this type of reactor. And you go to 500 to 2500 liters in the pilot scale. And in production, you're going to go up to 80 to 160 cubic meters. So to give you an idea, these things are uh, like five, six story tall buildings. And again, here at the bottom of the tank, that means you may have the equivalent of 25 meter of water on top of you. So humans have issues at that type of pressure, so do a lot of organism. So a lot of parameters are changing when you go from one to the other one. So <coughs> at the laborator laboratory scale fermentation, you, have, you can monitor and control different parameters such as temperature, pH, agitation, airflow, and the composition of the airflow, and the feed rate. So you can have feed batch, meaning you start with some sugar, it runs out of it, and you start feeding some more. That's usually the two type of process you're going to work with. Not continuous process, because these are too prone to contamination, and can be an issue, again, for this type of industry. You monitor the off-gas composition, oxygen, CO2, biomass, substrate, or metabolite level substrate, in that case not of the enzyme, but of the carbon source you put, so glucose, <coughs> maltose, sucrose, whatever you want. And you look at what they call the enzyme yield. I don't like the, that term, that's what they use, it's not a real yield, it's actually more a total activity. So the goal here, obviously, is to develop a small-scale <coughs> process which can predict what's happening at, at higher levels, if you can. So that's why if you have a well-known set of platform microorganisms, <coughs> you already have all this figured out. The main constraints in the scale-up and in the production is usually oxygen transfer. It's a major constraint in most fermentation. Most hosts are aerobic, and if they grow fast, when you have the industry production scale, like some, uh, we are talking about this morning, you don't want oxygen tanks in the factory or big <coughs> oxygen tanks because it's flammable, it's dangerous, and it's also an extra cost. Some promoters are also down-regulated at low oxygen levels, so you have to be careful with this oxygen transfer. So the factor affecting oxygen transfer are viscosity, so this one, you don't really have a handle on it. Because if you use a fungi and it makes mycelia, that's what's going to happen. We actually had some issues of <coughs> viscosity with bacillus. And it turned out it was the DNA of the sheared bacteria, which was increasing the viscosity and causing a lot of trouble. And the solution was to put a tiny bit of DNAs in the, in the tank. 
that was not really did not convince the people who wanted to move that fermentation process to production level because that was an extra cost and if you buy enzyme and you're an enzyme company that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. uh, agi agitation rate volume the impeller geometry so the, that's what we mean so this one are rushed on it's usually good for most organism in the case of yeast you're gonna have stuff which looks like propeller like a boat they're called marina the airflow rate you can have um, the composition can impact the oxygen transfer based on what you put in it and the media composition so in, in some cases <coughs> anti foam is going to have a big impact because of the decreased surface tension you uh, caused by that so you often have to spend a lot of time testing different anti foams with different microorganisms also. So fed batch preference since it allows control of growth and therefore of the oxygen demand. So if you know you cannot give that much too much oxygen in your fermenter, you can control that and stay below that threshold by feeding at the right level. So slower so it's not exponential and then you're not gonna have um, low oxygen zone in the fermenter. So here for example just three slides to show what kind of things you can do when you develop a process or your screen. So it's a feedback loop between the fermentation and the people who build the strains. So you have a strain, you build it with your industrial host, you put the right gene, and now you put it in a fermenter. Assuming this is what we think is the ideal enzyme production curve, you can be here. So you're not producing enough. So here are the different code transcriptions, so put new promoter or increase the copy number of translation, optimize the copy, or put different ribosome uh, binding sites. You have pool folding, so like we said, decrease the temperature or do expression of chaperones. So in some cases, you have to express auxiliary protein to help with uh, folding of your protein, but you do all that within the cell, so everything is with the organism. Or you have poor secretions, well, change the signal peptide, try a new host, try a different enzyme, it doesn't work, or go to mutagenesis. So same thing here, you have a good linear growth, but suddenly it starts leveling off in the middle, and you don't know why. So it could be genetic instability. <coughs> so you can try new promoters or new integration sites. You have a limitation in the feed, so supplement or try to engineer the strain to not uh, have a requirement for your cofactor. You have an inhibitor accumulation. Well, on that one, it's going to be tough because you have to go through some omics analysis, so metabolomics, to try to see what you're producing and then understand a little bit more the physiology of your organic. Maybe you can overfit, so sometimes Let's say in the case of yeast, if you put too much glucose, it's just going to shut down. They're going to have a catabolic repression system, and they don't want much glucose. They don't want it, they stop. Or you can have enzyme solubility, cell pH temperature, or proteolysis. So what are the solutions in that case? Well, knock out, or find different conditions, or put some uh, protease inhibitor to verify your hypothesis. So finally, this one, the most catastrophic. It looks all good, then you leave at night and you come back in the morning, it crashed. It happened, it's a pain, and it's really heartbreaking. So possible cause, you can have proteolysis. So again, you have to try all these things, delay the protease. <coughs> so you have to go back to the, to the drawing board in that case. That's a bad sign because there's most likely not much things you can do beside that at the process level. Or you have auto-inactivation. So what you can do is inhibit the activity. So we have some cases where some proteases were so active that when you secrete them, they start chewing each other happily. So what we did was uh, express a peptide inhibitor. So you express both, so the enzyme is produced, and then you have a protease 
uh, not a protease, but a peptide inhibitor which is going to get in the active site and block the protease activity. And then after, through the downstream process, you're going to be able to relieve and uh, get the inhibitor to get out of the active site by by, with the process. So from lab scale to plant scale. So you're here, you went there, now you went to the pilot, and you need to get there. Oxygen transfer, again, for, I think I said it three times now, it's an issue. The cooling capacity is not as good here as it can be here as well, so you have to take that into account. Um, in the biofuel industry, they were, which is different from that and not protein production, but just to give you an idea, turning on a cooler, a cooling system for the tank was estimated to cost about $50,000 just to turn it on. Okay, so that's going to be a big cost when you produce really cheap enzyme. So cooling capacity can be an issue, so you have to keep that in mind. Column pressure, like I said, you had major failure in production plant because the microbe you use could just not take it. And so all this work, you could not spot it here, it just happened in production. Massive loss and a lot of waste of resources. And one thing, you may not think about it, but there are few cases here, it's transparent, there is light. When you get there, there's no light. And light can be essential <laughs> to make some vitamin. I think it's vitamin A, which requires the last step is a photolysis. And you think you don't have any oxotrophy, but then suddenly you move to a stainless steel fermenter, and you don't, there's no growth, nothing happens. And it can be really head scratching for a while, and then you realize it's vitamin, vitamin A. But why is it working here? You have light. Here you don't, so that's an issue. It's not, it does not happen often, but it does happen. Light has some crazy properties that can do a lot of different stuff. We don't fully understand what's happening, so sometimes it can be something as simple as light. So now we are moving to scale up. Okay. Again, oxygen transfer because you have not as much energy you can spend into mixing. When you're trying to mix 50,000 liter of liquid, it requires a lot of <coughs> energy. You cannot have a nuclear power plants just for you. You have to keep that in mind, and your electric bill is a major cost, obviously, of your production. And so that means you're going to have oxygen transfer issue, and you're going to have gradients. I'll get back to that. In pH, temperature, and nutrients as well, because the residence time, things get might stay be fed on the top, but it might take a while to get to the bottom. Uh, you have more generation at large scale, so you need more stringent genetic stability <coughs> requirements, because if you start, so the funny thing when you start a production scale, you always going to start from a petri dish often, or a big one, but you start from there. It's really fun to see that you have this big flask with agar media and you have your microbe growing on it and what they put it's liquid and use a pre-inoculation tank so you move from a shake flask to a 50 liter or sometimes directly to a 100 liter where you're going to grow some biomass and this is going to be used to inoculate your fermentation tank. So you're going to go, the strain might be growing at exponential rates for a week which is not physiological. Soil microorganisms are barely in exponential phase, they are most likely in stationary phase. So you need super strong genetic stability. Uh, when it comes to the feed, well, limited choices, not everything is delivered in pallets of tons. So glucose is something, and also the substrate you use in the industry are not as clean as the one <coughs> you can order. So you're going to have impurities, uh, for example, glucose, usually you have 95% uh, purity of glucose, never 100. So what are these other 5% is a question. So different bulk media sources can have impact. Uh, yeah, media, you don't want, 
you want to do everything steam in place often or why it would cost too much money. Again, the operators are not scientists. So complex control strategies with operator intervention is risky. You want something really simple. So two-stage fermentation, just to make sure and decrease the risk of uh, operating errors. Prop failure, if you've been working with fermenters, there's always a problem with a prop. It can be the oxygen prop, it can be the pH prop, and this is gonna be an issue. Uh, well, the timing of the scale-up, it's a market condition. And not always when the strain is optimized. So sometimes you have to take whatever you get and move on. So you have a scale-up, like I talked about, so moving from the lab scale to the production phase. But you also have a lot of activities in fermentation labs in companies of scale down. Meaning you have historically a process and a strain for 10, 15 years has been working, but nobody ever questioned if the process was optimal. And obviously you're not going to do that in 500 or 2500 liters for a reason of cost. And don't even think about doing it in a fermentation tank because, in a production tank, because that's just economically not viable. So, scale up, you implement and adjust process, develop at lab scale to pilot and production. And in that case, it's the other way around. So that you want to use that for troubleshooting or optimization. Again, like I said, you may have issues in the production scale or you want to optimize. <coughs> Well, and then you move from pilot, so if you're in the scale-up, you move from pilot to industrial, and that's usually straightforward. So, sorry, to get back to the scale down, so if you have a production fermentation, usually that's what you get. So let's take the case of an 80 cubic meter fermentation with aspergillus in a fat batch. Your substrate is fed from the top, meaning that bacteria with fungi which are here are going to have first access to the substrate and therefore consume a lot of oxygen. If you have poor mixing, you're going to have different phase like that and things at the bottom may have really low oxygen, uh, really high oxygen because you're by where the hair is being bubbled. You have a lot of oxygen but no substrate and in that case you have a lot of substrate a lot of substrates and no oxygen because it's either consumed or doesn't have time to diffuse there. So you have different phases and that can be an issue because when you want to optimize an industrial process, you need to make sure that at the lab scale you're going to get that. And most of the lab scale fermenters are well engineered to not have this kind of phase issues. So you have to recreate that in the lab scale. You have to recreate this environment to fully be able to optimize the fermentation process. So that's why you do your scaled-down industrial process, right? From here to there. So how you do that, you need to simulate the production scale in the lab. And one of the easy things to do, actually, it took years of development to come down to this simple conclusion, <coughs> you need to do what we call the pulse feed rate. So that way you're going to mimic a little bit what's happening. So you're going to, let's say, turn on your pump for two seconds and wait three seconds. So then, here you create this phase. So you're going to have high substrates and low substrates. Because if you have two, you have really good mixing in lab scale, so you won't really need to find failure in the system to recreate that. So why do you want to do that? Again, to mimic what you find at the production scale. There is no way you could improve an industrial production of enzyme using your regular lab scale, knowing you don't have these phase issues. So here it's just to show, I'm not going to go through the example, but it's just to show that the pulse pose in lab scale has no effect on the biomass or the protein yield or protein distribution, etc. So here you have the pulse, you have continuous pulse, yes, pulse and not pulse, made a mistake. Anyway, 
it overlaps, meaning that at the lab scale, you don't see much difference. So you still have the exact same fermentation process, and it works, but you create, you create this zone in the tank, it has no impact. But what you will see is that it has a significant difference in the fungal morphology. So here it's continuous feeding, and here it's pulse feeding. <laughs> Right. By continuous, in that case, we meet feed batch with no interruption. So the morphology in that case you observe in the pulse feeding is going to be close to what you have on the industrial scale, meaning now you have a good system to go and troubleshoot your production scale. So you downscale for process improvement. In that case, you show that the pulsing is actually reducing the viscosity, which is what you observe in your tank at the uh, industrial tech, which is good, so you're really mimicking knowing your lab scale what you saw in the industrial scale. And you notice that you can be more aggressive with the feeding now in your lab scale. You have a good scale down system, a good industrial uh, process in your lab, so now you can push the system and see what kind of improvements you can make. And in that particular case, it was observed that at the lab scale, Using this pulse feeding, you will not optimize recreating these uh, issues in the process. And you could actually get up to 75 more enzyme produce over time at 40 hours. And when this was transferred from the lab scale to the pilot and to the production scale, it stays true. So if you didn't have developed this scale down process and did not have a good lab scale process which mimics your industrial process, you never could have been able to push the system and improve your fermentation because of the mixing. So that's kind of the conclusion of that. Scale down is good for optimization because you cannot optimize in an industrial fermenter. So conclusion here is that well most of the industrial constraints, like this morning, are linked to the economics of production and the application. Your production host must be a robust and a stable producer. Obviously, you don't want it to crash because each time you put a host in a tank, you don't know if it's going to work. You're gonna, it's, it's not good. You want a high secretion potential with low background secretion, so you always have a clean background, and the only thing you'll get in your growth is actually a pure enzyme pure, but like I was talking about this morning, sometimes it crystallizes in your fermenter, so that means it's pretty good. Uh, you want to develop and optimize a platform chassis host for your industrial production, so a lot of time spent and resources invested in that case. Fermentation must be low cost in the case of the commodity compound, which I enzyme, low cost enzyme are. And your industrial fermentation improvement is an ongoing process, meaning that even if you've been running the same process over and over, but now you have a good lab scale process which mimics your industrial uh, fermentation, then you can go and start cycle of improvement. Because sometimes you can produce two times more, which means you're fair to produce the same amount of enzyme going to need two times less fermenter. And these tanks, which are not used to produce your enzyme, can be used to produce another enzyme. Right? And then you lower the cost, and you can also overall improve your production of enzyme, depending on the demand. <coughs> so that's all I got for this talk. Thank you. Again, here's my email address if you have any questions, if you need it.